So uh, we're, this morning we talked about uh, the research and treatments and, you know, just to remind you, uh, the mission of the National MPS Society is to cure our kids. That, that's, that's our first and foremost mission and we support families uh, until we can do that. So our goal is to put ourselves out of business and uh, I think with the good work that we saw earlier this morning that we're going to do that someday. And I think I'm going to see that day. I really do. So, uh, so that's, that's real exciting. So at this point we're going to move into uh, some of our more family oriented part of the sessions. And I'm um, um, pleased to introduce Ross Burning. He's going to talk about his family's experience with the MPS 3A Natural History Study. And uh, we're just going to go ahead and welcome him to tell us about his family. Good morning. My name's Ross. Um, I was asked uh, prior to the conference if we could come and share our experience being part of the Natural History Study. And uh, you know, we got an email, and, and that night I got home, and my wife's like, did you get the email? Uh, they asked us to be part of that. We're not going to do it, right? Because she's very nervous about it. And I'm like, well, um, I may have already responded that we would do it. So, <laughs> so that's why I'm here, and uh, she's in the audience. So I want to start off with just a little bit about you know, who we are and how we got to be at this point. This is our family. It's our son, Colin. He's uh, five years old, um, just about six, actually, at this point. And um, he has MPS 3A. And then uh, there's, there's Hillary and I, mom and dad. Colin's story began relatively early. Um, we noticed he had a large liver at about 18 months. And so we, that took us down a path of seeing several different specialists. And um, we ended up actually getting a false diagnosis based upon a, a liver biopsy that he had a glycogen storage disorder. So in some ways, we were a little bit relieved because we got out of genetics with glycogen storage disorder. And he seemed to have a mild form of it, so we said, you know, hey, you know, it could have been worse. Um, the, uh, but that diagnosis didn't really ever set well with our geneticist or really with us because the symptoms never seemed to quite match up with that. You never got hypoglycemic, you never got sleepy, you know, if you didn't eat, things like that. And he had some tests that were showing gags in his urine, and so we did, you know, repeat some of those tests and um, eventually did the skin biopsy that was definitive and, and gave us the proper diagnosis. So you know, as, as many of you are aware, that's you know how devastating that can be. And you know, after that first few days, we kind of turned to say, well, what can we do about this? What what are you know? Is there you know our geneticists will help us say there is no treatment, but you know we immediately want to say, well, you know, there's no treatment now, but is there something in the works? Is there something that maybe we could call in a part of in terms of a, a treatment clinical trial? And of course, there there wasn't anything at that time. I think it was just a, probably a little bit after the, the uh, bone marrow transplant trials had, had been uh, closed. Uh, but did, we did see that there's a natural history study that was available um, that was enrolling children actually older than Colin. Colin was only uh, two and a half at the, by the time of our first visit, so he was under two at the point of diagnosis. And we um, uh, looked at the study, and the study was um, a multi-day affair with developmental testing. Um, on one day and um, some different other behavioral type tests. Uh, they're going to test them for autism spectrum, that type of thing. And then it was a day of, of uh, more clinical testing, so a, a very detailed head MRI, uh, lumbar puncture to, to get some cerebral final, spinal fluid, and um, they did an ABR, and they also would put ear tubes in if, if necessary. Uh, which did in, involve being under anesthesia for quite some time. And so that, there's certainly some risk involved with, you know, enrolling Colin in that type of a, a study because any, surger, any uh, procedure like that has some amount of risk. But the risks were relatively low. And we, we, you know, we had to decide, is this something that we would want to, Colin to participate in? And so, you know, that was, you know, for me it was a, a pretty short decision-making process, but it still wasn't an easy one. Part of what we were looking for was, you know, this won't directly benefit Colin today, but it may benefit him in the future if this helps lead to treatment. And we also, you know, thought that it's not a bad thing to get to know the researchers that might be doing a clinical trial in the future, and if nothing else, establish that we could be you know, reliable patients and come to all the visits and stuff, which 
you know, talking with other clinical trials in other areas, other diseases, is, can be actually be very challenging. So we decided that we would participate. Um, it, it actually, uh, we actually had to talk with the researcher, Dr. Whitley, to, um, about his age, because at that time the minimum age was three years old, and we, Khan was still only two. So we got that, that um, they, they were in the process of changing that so they could get enough, uh, enough uh, participants. And at that point, we were um, all set up to go. The, uh, we, we went on our first trip, and it was, we flew. And we live in Madison, and, and the, the, the trial was in Minneapolis. So it's only, it's one of those plane rides where by the time you get up to the, the, the full height, you start coming back down. It's about 40 minute um, time in the air. But still traveling with any child, it can be, it can be difficult, especially with a San Filippo child who you know, throwing things is, is a little bit more um, readily apparent in, in those kids than maybe uh, an, an unaffected child. So traveling was certainly, you know, a bit of a challenge, but we took, we would fly up there and the, and the um, Shire was running the study, uh, took care of all the travel arrangements, so they took care of our flights, they took care of rental car and a hotel, gave us money for food and that type of thing. So there really wasn't any, at that time, out of the pocket um, kind of concerns for us. Um, the, the study in general, the first, the first visit, we went for four visits over a course of about two years. The first study took, uh, the first visit was an extra day and there was an initial period where, you know, Collins seemed to meet all the, on paper, all the enrollment criteria, but uh, there was an, a spe special day, the first trip, where uh, they, we met with the researchers and went over, you know, Collins' development and things like that, and they wanted to make sure that he was actually, um, could participate in the study and we'd sign the paperwork and that type of thing. And from, the, from after that first day, we kind of got into a routine for each of those four visits. The first day of the study, that we, a full day, would be the developmental testing day. So Colin got to, you know, play, doing some very structured activities that were um, the, the testing score, the testing uh, areas. Um, he was tested for if he was on the autism spectrum, which, which Colin is very, very, very social um, little boy, uh, and so, so that wasn't something that was relevant for us. Um, there was also a step where, as part of the study, there was a bit of a, like, watch a, watch a video while you wear a, a, a kind of a net type of thing with all these sensors on it, and Colin had none of that. Uh, he, since birth, is not like to be constrained in any way. He wouldn't let us swaddle him even. He would get mad at us. Um, so he was not having any of that, and the, the researchers were great. They were rolled with it. We're very accepting that, hey, he's just not going to get, um, not going to cooperate for this. Uh, and that was a relatively, you know, it was a, little, it was a relatively straightforward day, and it was, wasn't that hard. It was a lot of playing and, and that type of thing. The second day um, of, the, of the trial for each visit was the clinical day, and so that meant getting up at 4 or 5 a.m. to get into the hospital to go through the pre-surgical preparation, which for Colin is pretty simple since he's not actually, it was more of some tests that they were running, but they had to put him under anesthesia. So it was mainly just keeping entertained in the hospital until it was time for him to go back. Uh, and then he would be under for a number of hours while they did these very detailed uh, head MRIs and did the lumbar puncture and did the AB, um, ABR to test his hearing. Um, and that got to be, you know, and that was, had its own challenges as well. And then after that, it was, um, you know, uh, Colin would come out of the anesthesia. Um, we'd take him back to the hotel and, you know, get food, order room service in, and he'd nap quite a bit. And by the end of the day, usually he'd be back to his normal peppy self. And then the day after, they would, they, they would uh, give us an extra day to recover, so then we would fly out um, on the, 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 the fourth day. Uh, the, uh, usually it would be a, a Thursday we'd fly out. So each trip kind of had that pattern. Um, usually it was, each trip was about four days of vacation for, each, for, for Hillary and I. And I would say that um, the, the, uh, one of the things that we found really remarkable was almost very quickly, even after the first visit, uh, we fell into a pattern. You know, so that first one was like, well, where are we going? You know, I think we went to the wrong terminal on the way back and um, had to you know, uh, loop back around to catch our flight out and stuff like that. So the first one was a little bit tougher. But the second, third, and fourth trips just got, you know, at that point, it was just a routine. Um, it was just a straight, very straightforward. We knew what to expect. We had been through it before, and it was just, just a lot easier. 
Um, at the time, Colin was not as big as he is now, so starting at, you know, I've got some pictures showing kind of how he was at the time, um, you know, more of the two and a half and three year old uh, ranges. So he's a little bit smaller and easier to, easier to fit on an airplane, so that was a benefit. Um, the, uh, well, you know, there were definitely lows and highs to the trip. So, you know, one of the, I think the, the deepest low was um, when they put us in the wrong row in the airplane and we had to move his car seat uh, with the plane fully loaded, door closed, waiting on us to take off. And, uh, you know, so trying to unbuckle a car seat, a uh, full-size car seat from an airplane with those flip, you know, those, those hinge um, seat belts with 100 people uh, staring a hole in the back of your head is, is um, a little blood pressure raising. It was a little difficult. But outside of some of those things, um, you know, there was a few other low, you know, it was, it was difficult. It was, you know, the waiting on the clinical day while he's under anesthesia was, was kind of difficult. You know, he was in good hands. You know, it wasn't anything very, you know, very risky that was happening, but it was still something that, you know, we were concerned about. So we found that bringing something to do while you're waiting made you know, tremendous, you know, was of tremendous help. There were a lot of highs. I mean, I think we didn't, I don't personally didn't expect there to be that much positive things to take away from something where if there's no treatment. Um, you know, first of all, Colin had fun. You know, we found ways, there was lots of time to, for example, uh, our routine was we would fly in on Monday, we'd go to Mall of America. He would ride the escalators as much as he wanted. Um, and when he got a little bit older and, and wasn't scared of some of the rides, he would ride the rides as much as he wanted and maybe we'd get him a, a present or something like that. Um, you know, same, similar thing, sometimes we go back to Mall of America or we maybe go to the zoo or something on the second day after the, the testing was done, because we might be done at three o'clock and, um, and so we'd go and make the most of it, visit friends that we had in town and things like that that had children he could play with. And then our routine for the last day was, um, before, you know, we would fly out maybe in the afternoon and we would take Colin to the Children's Museum and he just had a, has a ball. We have lots of videos of him just having complete, you know, over the top good time with all the different things that he could play with there. So we feel like Colin, to Colin it was, yeah, some difficulty, and, but a lot of it, I don't think he realized that this was something that, you know, he potentially could have, you know, um, he shouldn't enjoy, right? A lot of it was like, let's play with the researchers now, let's, you know, so really the clinical day is probably the hardest one to him, but he was asleep for most of it, so that also uh, made it a lot more easy for us parents to accept. Um, you know, when we look at, uh, in, you know, after the fact, um, what we felt about that particular study, which is, which is closed now, um, you know, there were a lot of benefits that we didn't anticipate. So, you know, first of all, we met to, got to meet um, another family and connect with them. Uh, the Zagami family, um, Roy, I think, is here with uh, their, their son, Reed, is just a little bit older than Colin. It was great to kind of connect. And we had that, you know, in the, in the um, uh, breakfast area of the hotel. And, and that, you know, that, that family comes in and we didn't know they were there, uh, but immediately it was, you know, we kind of looked at each other and said, we know, you know, we, we're gonna know you because um, of our connection. Uh, we learned a lot about the diagnosis, especially that first trip um, because, you know, we had been diagnosed so recently, but also we got to, you know, kind of hear from the researchers what they were hearing, what they were seeing and how Colin was similar and how he was unique compared to other kids in the study. And that we found that, just kind of beneficial to help understand just how unique Colin is, because um, you know where where we're at in the, the country, there are some other families, but in the area, but um, not with children in Colin's kind of age range. And so it's was kind of nice to see that have that objective opinion about you know you know Colin's you know very very social. Like oh okay, you know that's something that we didn't quite realize was very much a Colin thing and not something indicative of you know all the kids. Um, you know, we got to meet the researchers, both got to, got, got to know them socially, but also it was um, good to talk with them, pick their brains a little bit. We often got the opportunity at the end of the day to sit down with them and, you know, ask questions. You know, how did Colin's head MRI look? Were you able to tell anything? You know, what kinds of things have you seen with other children what, how, that are further along? Well, how do you, what kinds of things should we be looking for or maybe focusing on most? What, you know, we're talking to some of the um, behavioral researchers, they'll they're be able to tell, describe, they'll what kinds of difficulties they see of the kids having and you know where maybe we should push Colin when we got home. And so we came out of that with almost a plan. Uh, it helped to build our plan with our with the teachers and with the, our doctors back in Madison about how what's best for Colin and gave us a better sense of what that is. 
Um, we, we certainly got some benefit out of the test data itself, so we were able to take that ABR and take it back to his ENT doctor and, and you know, ha have that provide more information about Colin's hearing and, you know, is it the right time for hearing aids, things like that. Um, the developmental data was very helpful to help set expectations with folks about saying, well, Colin, you know, the last, the last visit, Colin was just about five, five years old, just about a year ago, and to say, well, you know, he's, he might be five, but he developmentally is about two and a half. So set your expectations accordingly. Don't, you know, don't, uh, don't try and limit him, but don't try and, you know, get frustrated that he isn't performing at a four-year-old level or something like that. You know, as we mentioned, we had a lot of fun and tried to have as much fun as possible. Um, it also helped that the um, hotel had free beer in the evening, so that, that was helped mom and, mom and I have fun. You know, and there were some other bumps. You know, I think the, the you know, Shire and, the, and not more specifically the travel company that they were working with, there was a learning curve for them as well. So the first hotel that we were in was uh, right on campus, very most convenient location possible, really small room. You know, kids literally could bounce off the walls. You know, Colin was pretty small at that point, luckily, but um, we spent a lot of time on that build, That hotel also had escalators, so we spent a lot of time on those escalators just because, you know, trying to run them outside of the room. There was enough room for him to decompress. On the further visits, we had a more of a residence type hotel, separate bedrooms, separate, you know, actually had a kitchen, had a lot, it was a lot more of a San Filippo compatible hotel room. So that, you know, so there we saw, definitely saw kind of there's a learning curve for everyone um, there too. So in the end, I think we're, you know, we're really glad that we did it. I mean, I think we would have, you know, we made the right decision, would do, make that decision again. Um, you know, I'm part of it is we did something. You know, to, you know, there's one of the frustrating things is there's so little we can do to, you know, um, in the long term to help you know, our kids. And so we have to focus on what we can do in terms of, you know, fundraising and, and, and uh, raising awareness and things like that, but also, you know, in terms of helping the scientific process along. Um, you know, I think it also, you know, our kids have, have legacies in different ways, you know, and, and part of, a big part of them, their legacy is the impact they have on other people that they meet through, as they go through their life. But this was an opportunity for, to, for Colin's legacy to be more than that, to have it be, um, you know, if he has to be an un, one of the kids that has to go untreated for some amount of time to be one of the last. And we thought that was a big uh, potential benefit. So, you know, in, in retrospect, you know, we're glad we did it. We, you know, and um, we have no qualms, no concerns about recommending other folks do it. But it is a very personal decision in terms of where you're at with your family. And, and those types of things, but for us, it was it was a definite, um, the right thing to do. Thank you.